Brian, thank you for coming on Product Hunt Live. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm glad I'm glad to be here. You know, I want to start, and we're going to have a lot of questions from the audience, but I want to start by with uh, you know, I listened to the Tim Ferriss uh, interview with you, and it was it was fantastic. I'm I'm curious, you know, and and you guys covered so much there, but after doing that, and it was a bit ago, what's something that uh, you felt you wanted to talk about that wasn't discussed, or that you, you know, felt you wanted people to know about you, or what you're up to, or just what are your thoughts post that? Yeah, so I guess one thing we didn't just, uh, Tim and I talk a lot. We have these hikes. We go out and walk around for a couple hours, and we talk about things that we care about the most. And one thing we spend a lot of time on is the things we can uniquely add value in the world. And so the question came up is, like, what can I do specifically that would add value in the world that no one else can do? And where am I wasting my time? And we talked a lot about that. And the areas that I guess I'm most interested in is I, I ask my question this, I ask myself this question repeatedly what could I do that would help humanity thrive? Like the single greatest contribution. And I think there's a couple of things under that umbrella. One is that I think our existing ideological structures are of great importance, like how we understand ourselves, our aspirations and our, our identity. And if you look at the things going on in the world, they're driven largely by how people understand themselves. And so I think there's this great opportunity right now in the world for us to reorient our aspirations and identity. What do we aspire to become as a species? And, and then also, I guess, uh, something that's happened since the Tim Ferriss interview is I'm, I'm now pretty close to starting a company, which I've been exploring for the past year and a half. Uh, I can't, I'm not talking about it yet, but it's something I'm really excited about. Wait, I lost you, Eric. I can't hear you. Sorry. Is there anything you okay. can tell us? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe, not what it is, but maybe what inspired it or kind of a broader idea behind it or, or anything you can shed light on to what type, you know, where deep inside it's coming from? Yeah, I guess I would say that it's the answer of the question I repeatedly uh, asked myself, what could I do to help humanity thrive? Like, what is the most audacious thing I could build that would add the greatest value to humanity? And this is the answer that I repeatedly came to. And so I, I've never been this excited about uh, what I'm about. Oh my God, I'm so curious. <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> when can we expect to learn more? Uh, probably a year. It'll probably take me a year to build out the, the, the foundation and to be ready to be public with it. Um, but like I said, I'm incredibly excited about it. Yeah. And where did you think uh, or what needed to become true for you to realize now is the time to focus on it as opposed to you know the other things you were? So it, it took me a long time. I mean, it, as you heard in the Tim Ferriss interview, this all goes back to when I was 21 after I returned home from Ecuador, living among extreme poverty for two years. And I I came home with this burning desire that I wanted to spend my life trying to improve the lives of others. And I didn't quite know what the answer was at the time. I looked at the things that were available to me on a college campus, but nothing really resonated. And so I spent, you know, I determined I would become an entrepreneur, retire by the age of 30 with abundance of capital and with freedom of time and then figure it out. And it did, it took me about 15 years to like really figure out the things I wanted to focus on. And I wanted to be very careful because anything you build is going to take seven to 10 years to do a minimally good job at building it. And so I wanted to be very careful in the selection of what I pursued because I wanted to devote that amount of time to make sure that it was um, successful. Yeah, and you know, this is it's very interesting that we're talking about this kind of concept of, you know, what's the best thing to help humanity thrive right after, you know, Mark Zuckerberg gave, you know, the 40, right. you know, 99% of his net worth. And it, it seems that um, it's kind of a philosophical conversation right now we're right. having like, you know, what's the best way for people who've made a lot of money and it doesn't have to be, you know, $45 billion, even, you know, half a billion, you know, whatever amount of money, uh, yeah. you know, to put it to, to good work. And what are your kind of thoughts on like the broad, you know, I know you, you've identified one specific thing, um, but kind of the broader right. conversation. Uh, do, do you think we're having it? Do you like how we're having it? Um, what, what are your thoughts there? Yes, yeah, so I think that, Zuckerberg's move, I think, was really interesting on a lot of fronts. I'm colored by the frame. There's this great video that Carl Sagan did titled The Pale Blue Dot. And if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to watch it. And it basically, it looks at planet Earth a couple hundred million miles away. And it contemplates what will become of us in the larger context of the universe. And to me, it establishes such a great frame of understanding who we are and what we can aspire to be. And so if you look at like what Mark Zuckerberg is doing or ISIS, or 
or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or anyone who has enormous capital, or even individuals with no resources, right? So take myself back uh, 15 years ago when I had absolutely nothing. And the thing that compels what we do in life is our ideological beliefs, right? That our beliefs and our values and the things we aspire to, how we understand ourselves. And that's what I think is so important to humanity right now is that we, we have these fragmented belief systems, which is fine. I believe in pluralism. I want pluralism. But I want these pluralistic to beliefs to align so that humanity can thrive. And so Zuckerberg has a clear frame of mind and how he understands himself in the world and how he's going to expend his resources. But just as importantly, an entrepreneur at the age of 21 today also maintains certain beliefs and values that compel them to behave certain ways. And so I think it's important across the spectrum that we examine that carefully and reflect deeply upon what it is that's motivating us. Uh, and how do you look at, you, know, you started the OS fund in 2014, right? How right. has that been, uh, how, how do you look at that retrospectively in the kinds of the, how you feel it's gone, uh, you know, things you wish you did differently? What, what are your thoughts? On that? Yeah. Well, so when I sold Braintree, I wanted to figure out who the people were who were working on the most audacious endeavors in the world both solving problems and pursuing opportunities. And so I called a couple of my friends and I said, who do you know? And then I played that game out to roughly 250 to 300 people in a matter of months. And I covered so much territory in connecting with some of the most amazing people on planet earth. And I wanted to understand what they were working on, why they're working on it. And I got this, I built this mental map of, of the endeavors I thought were critical. And I started zeroing in on a few of them. And I've just been inspired beyond what I previously couldn't imagine of people who dare to take on these audacious endeavors. And um, I'm more persuaded than ever of the power that scientific breakthrough has within society. And that if we are going to succeed as a species, then scientific breakthrough is going to be an important element of that. And yet there just aren't the right mechanisms in place in society today with government funding and, and the lack of VC funding within science to fund these kinds of breakthroughs that we need. Yeah. And what are your kind of like, as you think about 2016 for the OS fund, how do you think about, you know, goals for, the, for, for that? Well, we, I think we are getting a lot better in our investments. And so the problem I had was I don't have a background in science. And so approaching very uh, companies that are very technical, like in synthetic biology and genomics, I had to acquire the expertise both uh, personally, but also through a team to make intelligent decisions about these companies. And so we, we actually went through this process internally trying to figure out how we make good decisions as a team. And then we built a playbook that we open sourced to the world and said, here's been our journey. Here's how we're considering making good decisions when you're dealing with very complicated scientific endeavors. And we're hoping to build a broader community in doing so. And so I think hopefully that the broader community, we can participate within the broader community of trying to make good decisions on funding the most important scientific breakthroughs. But it's, it's a very hard uh, problem to what what are some and this is one of the questions in the audience what are some old and hidden industries that could benefit from os level thinking yeah so you know it's funny i found uh, payments as you know seven years ago when i started braintree is like this broken um invisible industry that like no one really cared about the technology was a decade old and we got to go in there and, and clean up and uh, it was a fantastic opportunity to realize that there are these industries that just sit invisibly so while everyone's at the cocktail parties talking about whatever is like the sexiest startup at the time or the industry, there's all these other invisible industries sitting around there and they're sitting everywhere within uh, science. So right now the things we like a lot are material science. We think there's enormous opportunity. I also like genomics a lot. The ability to, I think it could, using genomics combined with, with machine learning and other health data could be the biggest breakthrough since germ theory and we could radically extend our healthy human lives in the hundred plus. And then also, Synthetic biology, the ability to, to program bio, biological elements to do certain things for us. The fact that the, the world is biology, your biology, I'm biology, and we can program this biology is one of the most significant breakthroughs we've ever had in our history. Yeah. And what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions that people have around, um, like the biggest problems that we have? Like, where is everyone focusing their attention that they should be focusing less? And where are they not focusing? Yeah. So I, uh, I tend, I'm not necessarily a, a big problem snob. I think that what people work on is relevant. I think everything can pursue meaningful endeavors. I don't think there's this checklist of that's the right thing to do and that's the wrong thing to do. I think it's this really broad ecosystem of people contributing to solving big problems, which I find very compelling. 
And so I zero in on the place that I find unique interest, um, the things that get me excited about and the things I love to work on on a daily basis. And I think that's true in a much broader set in the community. And so I have focused on scientific endeavors and breakthrough as the key thing in this new company I'm going to start. But that's not to say at all that there is this test that someone has to go through and say, am I working on something that you know qualifies? I think, you think it's, I think it's uh, improper thinking that, that leads people astray. I'm going to put problem snob on my uh, Twitter bio. I like that. As a, <laughs> yeah, I, it is interesting. I mean, not to get in terms of you know relativism or, or the snob concept that you know I, I hear you on that, but it is very interesting yeah. that the people often who get to decide um, kind of where these dollars go are the people who make who made the money, and those are you know some sometimes you you want to trust the you know those aren't it doesn't necessarily correlate that those the people who made the big businesses are the people who are the best to kind of uh, you know, say where the money's going. And I think that's where some of the, yeah. well, you know, the, the recent move is, is incredible. I think some of the criticism is some people think that government should have a bigger role or, or if not government, then I, I don't know, they're a little bit frustrated just based on what I just explained. What do you think about, what do you think of, how do you make Yeah, so I mean, I agree that that's, that's what I love about society is we can have this pluralism where I think it's a legitimate criticism that, you know, Zuckerberg has in this enormous amount of money He's going about trying to do things in the world. The same is true with me. I now have immense resources I didn't have before, and I'm making decisions that collectively represents a lot of people's salaries or whatever. And um, I think it's a relevant consideration. I think it's a relevant critique. And I think that as a society, in the way we've we've built our society through capitalism and um, resource allocation, that that we need to everyone needs to pursue what they believe is the best for the world, and we need to work, somehow work through our systems. I think that. Uh, one thing I worked on uh, the past couple of years is the idea of uh, governance systems. So like just the whole idea of how we cooperate. And so if you think about like, for example, the US constitution is basically a system of cooperation. We agree to obey certain rules. We agree to allocate resources a certain way. We agree on certain punishments. We agree on power distribution, but it's basically just a rule set for cooperation. And how we cooperate in the future with the new rule sets being applied with technology and our interactions, I think is just equally as relevant. And so I think all these factors come into play on this big, complicated system of how we here on planet Earth cooperate to actually create a, a good future. Is when you say you're not a problem snob in terms of you know what problems are are both focused, are you also kind of uh, you know, you're okay with a structure of how those get focused, whether it's uh, nonprofit, whether it's uh, you know for profit, whether it's you know government, whether it's you know because there was some crit critique on that decision as well to make it an LLC. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, I wrote this, I had this um, panel I was on earlier this year at Collision, and the topic was how to do good with tech. And it was such a fascinating question to me because the, the question was like, what is good, right? If, even if I say, okay, Eric, we're going to extend healthy human life to 100 plus, and I would say, you know, I like to live, uh, I, you may like to live, extending our lives may be a good thing, but even something as basic as that, we disagree on. And people will say, well, you know, really 70, 80 years old is just enough for me, and like, I, I want to move on. And other people say, yeah, that'd be great. So like, we can't agree on even like the most basic things. And so uh, I wrote this article that basically said, instead of focusing on doing good, build good tech. And so the answer is to build good technology and follow it wherever it leads. And that is the best thing we can do um, throughout the world. And so we focus, I, I guess in my investments, I focus on companies that are building really good technology. Now, sometimes there's very complicated questions that arise, for example, if the investments in genomics happen to show we can extend healthy human life to 120 years of age, that's going to be incredibly complex for humanity to deal with, right? Good and right, positive and negative effects. And the same is true with synthetic biology. There's pros and cons on that. But I'm a firm believer that the way to slice that up is to build good technology. And we as society can then cooperate around that on how to figure out the optimal uses for it. Yeah, that was great. Uh, Ryan has a, has a great question. Why did you uh, sell Braintree to, to PayPal? I mean, it's always a very complicated uh, answer, right? I mean, like it's a situation because uh, I started the company as a sole founder. I bootstrapped it for nearly five years. I poured my heart and soul into that company. Like, I, I loved it. Uh, you know, it's very, very hard to articulate how much you, you pour into your company. And I think the team members felt the same way. Um, it was the right time, the right opportunity, and uh, it just made sense. I, I had always wanted to, I set my sights at the age of 21 on trying to spend my life trying to improve the lives of others. And this was a great opportunity to move on to the next stage. 
I always wanted to do what was best in the best interest of team members and uh, the company. And I felt like all those things made sense at that time. And tell me more about uh, you, the decision when you were 21 uh, that you made. How, how did, how did... Well, so I, I lived among extreme poverty in Ecuador, and I just saw how these people didn't really have a shot at life. And it was such a shock to my comforting, my middle class family uh, from the United States of America. And so I came home and I looked around at people who would go to jobs like you know, nine to five and they'd make good money and they'd take two weeks of family vacation. And I saw their schedules and I thought, like, this doesn't make sense to me. And then I started thinking like, it didn't make sense to me to trade my time for money. I didn't want to go get a job and pay $8 for every 60 minutes I spent at someone else's employment. I also had desires. I wanted to build something myself. I wanted my imagination and creativity to be able to run the show and not play by someone else's rules. And I started piecing all these things together. And I did care immensely about trying to help other people. And so I did. I just said, like, I'm not going to work. I'm not going to get a job. I'm not going to work until I'm 65. I'm not going to live that normal life. I'm going to, to chart my own path. I'm going to retire by 30. Wow. And I'm going to spend my life trying to do things that I believe are meaningful to the world. And for people who have similar goals, uh, want to retire at 30, let's mm -hmm. say they're 22 right now, how would you recommend they think about, you know, building it? Yeah, so I mean, my course was my my path was pretty tough. I mean, so I started my first company was a success, my second was a failure, my third was a failure, and then Braintree was a success. And so it was fifteen grueling, soul crushing years of work. Of course, it was at the end. I look back and I just remember all the great things, but I mean, it's, it was incredibly hard. And so there were moments, of course, I was laying in my bed at night where I just couldn't move. I was paralyzed by the stress. I had a young family, and like all the things that come up in doing this. So, I mean, it's, it's unbelievably hard. I stuck with it and in the end it worked out for me, but um, it certainly was a hundred times harder than I think I ever would have imagined. Well, and so, you know, obviously, obviously hard work is a, is a prerequisite, uh, but do you, do you advise them, you know, if they say, Hey, what about, in, you know, is this industry, you know, how do I think about what's the idea? Right. Where do I, you know, I know I want to start something. I know I'm ready. To right. I mean, I guess my, my go-to thought on this, and I guess I'll have some thoughts about advice later, but my go-to thought on this, when someone approaches me and says, hey, I would like to become an entrepreneur, I would like to try to achieve financial independence or, or achieve this goal and solve this particular problem, is I ask them, is it an itch or is it burning? Uh -huh. Like, where is it at? Because that basically is going to tell me how badly you want this and how long you're going to stick with it when things get hard, like how much fuel do you have in your tank because you're never really going to hit some really tough patches and you're going to be called to the mat so many times. And so the question really is how much do you want it and how resourceful will you be to overcome the challenges that will inevitably come your way? What if that idea is burning, but it's in a market that, you know, it's not a big idea. They're, they're burning to be a painter or, you know, some equivalent, I mean, painter could be, but you you know, some equivalent yeah. of a startup world. Yeah, I mean, so I think it depends on what per, uh, someone's objective was. My particular need, I wanted to create enormous wealth to retire by 30. And so the things I pursued had to have a big enough opportunity to create that kind of outcome. But at the same time, someone else's ambition may be in the act of creation if you're an artist. And so it may not be tied to monetary gains. And so I think it just has to do with optimization of what you really want. And um, everyone wants different things in life. And I think those things can be catered to. You know, Braintree is known for being so uh, developer friendly. Uh, we have a couple of developers on our team who are big fans of it. What, uh, yeah. how did you focus on? So I made three goals for the company. One is that we would be the preferred payments provider by engineers around the world. Uh, two, that our employees would say it was the best company they'd ever worked for. And three, that our customers would write us love letters. And it worked like we we literally we accomplished all three where i do hear again and again people say that uh, we receive love letters on a daily basis people would say like i cannot believe how how sharp you guys are how well you take care of people how proactive you are every interaction i have is just so good from the documentation to the customer support everything you do and so the goal was to build an exceptional company with a soul and i think we we did that we built something really special and how, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. We talk a lot internally about delighting users and similarly in terms of like when we get letters of validation, it's, it's really amazing. What, how did, on the culture, tell me more about the culture uh, standpoint in terms of like making it the best place people ever worked for. What are, yeah. 
Yeah. So I didn't do anything top down. I didn't say like, this is how we're going to do it. It was really just bottom up and it was in the habits and the practices we maintained. So for example, I maintained a, a, a culture of radical transparency. Every Friday we had a town hall meeting and it was basically just like group therapy. Like, all right, everyone, what's on your mind? What are you concerned about? And like, I knew what was on people's minds. I knew what was being rumored around and we just had at it. And people just said exactly what was happening. Like, why did you hire this person from the outside instead of promoting, you know, so-and-so or why do they get that? these brand new screens and we don't get these new screens, like all the things that happen within companies. And so we just established these practices internally where people had the, they knew the expectation was that they had to be exceptional at their job. They had to make customers write them love letters of appreciation. Like we had these basic principles in place and then it just naturally grew. And so, and we fostered it. Um, I, mean, I put so much effort into building that culture. It took a, you know, stay on top of it, but eventually it kind of found its own momentum and grew on its own. Yeah. I'm curious, this is a great question from someone here. Uh, what are your thoughts on education broadly? Um, like, you know, what, do, you have, uh, do you have kids? I do, I have three kids. Uh, yeah. How old is your oldest one? 12. Do you think uh, they're going to go to college similar to, you know, co you know colleges that we went to? Um, so, you know, it's funny, I, my kids do well in school but I don't put a lot of place, a lot of emphasis on it. I place emphasis on their ability to learn and do. So when my son was seven, my, my second boy was five, I helped them start their first company. And we've now started four companies together. And uh, my eldest son, he built an app. It's in the app store. You're, you're making us and, look bad, Brian. <laughs> we, we did a Kickstarter project, um, raised a thousand dollars, but we, we built all these companies together and we, we have all these activities to pursue, but I really um, impress upon them ways to think and the way to acquire knowledge. The school simply on the rote memory and recitation, like that's so cool. If they get the grades, I'm happy for them, but really I want them to demonstrate that they know how to learn and do in life and be resourceful. And so I have, I mean, on, on the point of education, like I have been spending a lot of time at my children's schools. Like for example, I taught uh, the full day last week at my son's business uh, class, teaching them how to become an entrepreneur. And I'm teaching the full day tomorrow because uh, I wrote a children's book about how to become an wow. author. And so like being integrated into their lives and knowing their friends and understanding intimately what they experience in that world. But I think I'm left wanting a lot in how my children are educated. And I think there's so much more they could become in life if they just had a better system of learning and doing. Yeah. That. I mean, does it, does it frustrate you? You know, if you were starting a school, uh, you know, today, the ideal school for your kids. <laughs> So I honestly want to do that. I would love to just buy a, a house, hire a teacher and build my own school. I mean, it's just, I guess it's just like anything else I do in life. I just love building and I would love the, the creative challenge of structuring knowledge in a way that they could acquire and actually do. So yes, that's, that's my tendency. And that's what I'd love to do it's because the system is just way too complex right. to change. And I would rather ch choose other problems to work on. But yeah, for my own children, uh, definitely. Yeah, I heard you know, someone say that if you want to focus on education, uh, it's best to do it either super early or post adult, uh, where it kind of, wherever the government isn't <laughs> or wherever, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny. I mean, I, I bring kids deals I invest in. So I show them the right. deck, we walk through it. Uh, we take them to, I take them to business plan competition. So like, I really try to get them to be, to understand, um, basically mental models and thought processes. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, and how about when you think about like, are you a fan of online education? Do you think, does it like, you know, when you think what education looks like in the future, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, everyone has a different, a, a different preference on how they acquire knowledge. I always thought the school was like this 56K connection. When I sat on my chair and I listened to a, a person speak, the data connection was so slow for me that it just drove me absolutely mad. I'd rather go home and try to just like get a gigabit data connection and read books and figure it out myself. So if it fits a person's online learning preference, cool. If it doesn't, find a different avenue, but everyone is gonna learn a different way and I would rather support them in the way they want to acquire data. Yeah. What's something that you used to fervently believe that you, you now see as fundamentally misguided? Mm. Uh, I would say my, uh, my belief system. Wow. So yeah, um, so this is, this is a big one for me. Uh, it's, probably, it's one of the most important ones of my entire life. I, I grew up Mormon. And I grew up with this idea that you, you obey the rule book God has given to you and you, you obey the commandments and then you get this great afterlife prize of heaven and heaven's going to be this really great place. 
And so my life was basically focused on obeying rules of what this, this prize required. And as I no longer believed in, the, in the, the faith, I had to reconstruct my existence from scratch. And it was like this terribly tumultuous time where I had to figure out why do I exist? Is there an afterlife? Is there a God? All the existential questions we're faced with in life. And it was unbelievably hard. I don't think I've ever been through anything so difficult. And that's especially true when I came up through a family where like my entire community was part of this. And I, was, I am appreciative of my Mormon upbringing. I'm appreciative of my, of my family and I'm appreciative of the values I gained. But now I find my, my belief system uh, has made me a new person. And that's why I suppose I'm so focused on society's beliefs and values because I link, think back on how I was motivated as a human being and how I'm differently motivated now where before heaven was this prize to, to win based upon rule sets. And now I believe that we can actually, if we desire a world uh, that is like heaven-like, right? Where we imagine there's no conflict and people live without disease and stuff like that. I believe we can literally create that now, that we have the technological tools to create these, these uh, favorable settings for us. And so I've never felt more motivated uh, ever in pursuing what I'm doing because I think we can actually do this. Wow. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Kevin Kelly, uh, you know, writer and long now, was giving a, live, uh, a podcast recently. He was saying that he thinks there needs to be kind of a new uh, sort of mythology and kind of, I mean, all sort of saying like new religion to kind of, uh, you know, uh, coordinate or like be relevant to yeah. the fast changing technology and just how we live now. Um, what are your, what are your- I could not agree more. And so that's, I think what we we're talking about, for example, with Carl Sagan's Pell Blue Dot. Yeah. I now understand ourselves in that frame. If you look back at planet Earth in the greater context of the universe, what can we become as a species? And the reason I think that our time and place is so unique in all of history is that, so you think of like Leonardo da Vinci, he had his sketchbooks where he could draw out an airplane and a scuba, um, but he couldn't build it because he didn't have the tools to build it. We now have those tools. If you think about genomics and synthetic biology, AI, robotics, computer software, we can literally program every element of our existence. There's nothing we, we can't program. And so the question is, what kind of world are we going to build? And so it goes back before, Eric, to the question you asked, of like we look at like Zuckerberg and what he's doing with his money, and we look at what the government is doing and what individuals are doing, what ISIS is doing. We're all compelled by our understanding of our, of our world and what we think the prizes are. And so I agree with you 100%. There's few things of greater importance in our world right now than updating our belief system so that we cooperate to thrive as a species. And uh, how do you, you know, in your position of, of resources, of experience, uh, best contribute to, to that happening? Is that something that you potentially actively work on? Is that something that you support other people who are working on it? Uh, I don't want you to reveal too much if that's you know, something you're interested in doing, but what are your mm-hmm. thoughts? Yeah, so I'm doing a couple things actually. One is I believe, one, that the world's going to be defined in large part by our techno- the technology we build. So I want to support future literate entrepreneurs who are building a breakthrough technology which can benefit the world. And that includes genomics, synthetic biology, AI. Um, two is I have a great interest in children because if you, like I look at my children in 10, 15, 20 years from now when they reach their prime, these technologies that we have today, genomics, AI, synthetic biology will be in their maturity. And the things they'll be able to build would be remarkable. And I want them to approach those technologies with an understanding that they do so in this prolific society, that we're going to build great things that benefit humans. And um, so I'm, I'm launching a, a uh, effort around children next spring, which I'm really excited about. We've been working on it for a year. And then third, yes, I'm actively interested in how we approach ide- ideologies in society. I don't know what the answer is yet, but it's it's right there at the very top for me for things I, I think about a lot. Uh, tell us more, can you tell us more about the ch- uh, children initiative you've been thinking about for a while? Yeah, so I want, so if you think about what children, if I ask my 12 year old today, what do you want to be in life, right? What do you aspire to? And I walk through his thought process. Who does he admire? Why? What does he care about? Why? Um, I want to inspire kids to work on meaningful endeavors. And, and meaningful, again, I'm not a meaningful snob. What they find to be meaningful is important. And so I want them to understand our unique time and place in history, that we have these incredibly powerful tools of creation they can use. Two, they can build amazing things today that have dramatic impacts in people's lives. And three, that understand how they build their 
beliefs and values that what they believe is hugely influential in what they'll actually do. And so it's like part of the self-awareness, but I want to build a community around this where kids feel inspired, enabled, and capable of doing really hard things in society. You wrote a children's book. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? And uh, it's Yeah, so I, I always told my kids stories at night. I would lay down with them in the bed, and they'd say, Dad, tell us a story. I'd just make stuff up. And uh, I was actually decent at it. And so I thought, you know, I'll write these things down. So I started writing the stories down that it turned out to be a book. It's called Code 7. It's an anthology. There's seven stories. My kids are the protagonists. But they're stories about um, it's cracking the code for an epic life. So it teaches kids uh, morals about life. And then I'm writing a second book right now that will be hopefully out next year that's more on the end of science. But yeah, these books will be in line with this community work I'm trying to do to inspire kids to work on meaningful things be good human beings. Um, but yeah, I'd love to write, and it's been a fantastic project. The End of Science. Uh, tell us more about that. I'm Can sorry? Tell us more about The End of Science. The, what do you mean, oh, The End of Science? Oh, you said a book coming out next year that's called, uh, on the... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Around Got Science. You. I was yeah. like, well, The End no. of Science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Uh, so it's, it's about children who deal with technology to solve problems. And so it's about how, it's how kids interface with technology and how they can actually do big things. The End of Science is a very compelling title. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> right out there. I once read a controversial book. Um, actually, I think that's Donald Trump's next. Uh, next <laughs> um, how would you, you, you were talking a lot about morals as one of your book. How would you describe your, uh, where your sense of ethics uh, stands? So it's been entirely new. I'm very influenced from my upbringing in the, in the Mormon religion. So I do believe in community and, and trying to behave good, well in society, right? Helping others and being empathetic to people's needs. Um, I now have an entirely new set of beliefs as well, where my behaviors are driven by this belief that we have this shot to build out this amazing world. And we have the technologies to do so. We just need to have the right understanding and work together towards those ends. Are there certain thinkers uh, that have you know, seriously inspired you in this, or that you find your belief system really meshing with, with theirs? Or? It's like this, it's this broad collection of people from science, to, from the arts. I mean, it's really just, it's very broad. Um, I wouldn't identify any one specific source. It's just what I've compiled over the past 15 years. Who are some of your favorite thinkers uh, that if, you know, if someone read, they would get a better sense of, of you know, some of the things you think deeply about? Yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of uh, like being a, a father, um, there's a book called uh, from Mark Shriver called A Good Man. And it's basically, it's a love letter to his father, who was an extremely devoted uh, father to his children. And he's a model that I'd like to follow. I would love my children, I would love to be an exceptional enough father that my children would feel compelled to write me a love wow. letter and, uh, when, when they're of age. Um, that was very influential. I would say uh, Ernest Shackleton is also very influential for me. He was a, a British explorer in 1914. He had the choice to choose the most, any, any uh, outdoor adventure he could have imagined. And he chose to try to cross the South Pole. It was the most audacious thing anyone could ever could have conceived. And uh, he took this group down there and the treacherous journey is the most inspirational, most difficult thing I've ever read in my entire life. And when I think about the things I want to pursue in life, I try to channel my inner Ernest Shackleton. And I ask myself, would this pass the Shackleton sniff test? Is this the most audacious endeavor I could possibly conceive of? And then I'd probably say Viktor Frankl's Man's Search yeah. for Happiness, right? I mean, he, he was in like the worst possible circumstances. And somehow he figured out how to alter his, his mind, his state, to come up with an insight on how he could exist with the situation and thrive. And so him as a problem solver within these remarkably different situ uh, situations that I try to channel him as well and say, how do I make sense of my current situation and reframe my thinking to be adaptable to my circumstances? Re uh, regarding that second book, uh, I remember reading something with Larry Page said something like, you're either changing the world or you're not. And like a lot of people get kind of caught up uh, in terms of like, you know, doing the thing that will lead them to so, yeah. like get distracted with things but it's like you know you can do it or, or you're not it, it was it was interesting um what was the first book you recommended again uh it was a good man by mark right, right. Schreiber. tell me more about this idea of fa uh, being a father you know it's interesting my i just became an uncle you know uh my sister just had first kid and now i'm helping you know 
you know, she's doing all yeah. work. I'm, I'm helping a little bit. I'm yeah. reaping the, the benefits. Yeah. And I'm, you know, thinking, hey, you know, uh, it's my first time you know, extensively playing with a baby. You know, I could have one, one of these, <laughs> one of these someday. Did you, did you know you, you know, always like wanted to be a father and kind of I, I, yeah. when you were building brain sheet, did you think about it? You know? Yeah. So I, um, I have three brothers and one sister. So family of five, and we were best friends growing up. I loved my siblings, and I was uh, my older brother was my business partner for my first few companies, and I just loved my family, and so I always wanted that for myself. And so yeah, I always wanted children, and I had my first child when I was building um, my first company. So I have been with children my entire entrepreneurial journey, which was extremely challenging, and I've heard a lot of feedback over the past year or two as I've been more public about this, but people have felt like the fact that they have children is this big limiting factor on their ability to contribute in life. They feel like that the, other, the people who would otherwise compete with them are single and they can do whatever they want. Um, and they have no time risk limitations while they're at home trying to take care of their children. But I think people have found the strength in saying like, yeah, like you can have kids, you can build an exceptional company, you can do important things. And so I think it's a topic that I would love to talk about more because I think a lot of people feel um, inaccurately, they feel restricted by it. Well, this is the this is the place. Why do people? Uh, how do you make it work? You know, why why is it inaccurate? Uh... Yeah, so I think I mean two things. One is I have to I have a much smaller time budget than my than other people who I would otherwise work with, right? So if they have uh, eighteen hours in day to work or sixteen hours, I have maybe eight or ten because the other time is consumed by my my children, and I want to devote my time to my children to be a good father. And so I went through systematically uh, through my day and identified everything I absolutely must do and everything that I could optionally do. And so I've tried to just brutally cut everything outside of that normal parameter. And so it's been a game of efficiency and just architecting my time in a way that allows me to do what I need to do. But I think it can be done. I remember uh, reading, uh, you know, the hard thing about hard things. And I think Ben Horowitz had a, a kid at a young age and saying how it, it yeah. focuses you, you know, you cut. 100%. You have, you have less time to do the things that you need, and so you need to figure out ways. To, yeah, it, it, it drives you to be remarkably creative in how you get stuff done. Yeah. You have, you have this constraint. Yeah. Well, you know, I was about to say, you know, uh, you know, when you talk to friends who are thinking about whether they're ready to have kids or when they're, you know, yeah. um, I was, I, I was going to make it a broad question, but, you know, we both have a mutual friend, you know, and, and you, Tim Ferriss, you know, who's yeah. You know, yeah. thinking about it broadly. How, how do you think... Yeah. You know, how do you advise uh, you know people in that situation? So, um, I guess I really am reluctant in life to give advice because I think advice is like this personalized, contextual thing. When I give, if I were to say something to Tim, it would be based on my opinion on my when I was growing up as a child, how I felt about my siblings, if we got along or not. And so, I always try to put my context and say, like, here's my frame I'm coming from. Here's how I feel about it, and then like. You can do with it what you want, but I think that uh, trying to offer advice to someone else on this topic is just impossibly hard because it just no one can prepare to have kids, no one can say what it's like like to have kids, what the emotions you feel, the time required. Uh, so I generally try to Tim and I talked about this. I abstained from giving him any advice because I just felt like I wasn't qualified to chime in on that. Uh, what would you know? I want to ask like a little bit of kind of reflection questions. Um, what would the uh, you know, the, the Brian of two years ago, say to the Brian of. Um, you think you, you, you think you have a grasp on this, but you have no idea what's coming. Wow. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. The, the tension between staying humble and confident at the same time. Yeah, I guess like when you go back and read your journal from a year ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, sometimes it's like this embarrassing experience where you think, oh, like how could I have ever thought of, thought that way or written that? And then somehow we say in our current state of mind, like, well, I'm at, you know, I'm fine now. But then, of course, we're embarrassed in some ways by ourselves years down the road. And so uh, always remembering that, that um, the best is yet to come and being in our current state is, is fine. Are you an active journaler? I am, yeah. Is it a compulsion or is it a daily habit or? Yeah, daily habit. I like to chronicle. I like to document my ideas. I like to explore. When I somehow, when I press a keyboard on a computer, different thoughts come out than when I open my mouth and speak words. And so it's just a way for me to actually uh, figure out how I 
why I think what I think and explore various thoughts. I'm a big believer in uh, 10 minutes a day in the morning. You know, I know a lot of people do that. Um, when you think of, uh, do you have kind of heroes or role models in your life or how do you think about that, that concept? So I've, the, the bulk of my reading in life has been in biographies. I love human stories. And that's the way I prefer, I prefer to learn. I've probably read over a hundred biographies and the more raw the biographies are, the more I appreciate it. And so I love reading about someone who, if we, if we create it in society, if we, if we put this person on a pedestal and we think they're just an amazing human being, I want to know, of course, all the uh, secrets and things that they, otherwise they find unflattering. And I've drawn a lot of strength from these stories and from these humans who go through really difficult things. So that's primarily my, where I find my heroes and my models of how I want to behave and what I want to pursue. Give us a top three to five favorite biographies. Um, so I love Truman, uh, uh, how he came to power by McCullough, how he came to power during a really important time within the United States and made critical decisions. I like the book John Adams a lot. Uh, and I suppose I'm looking at U.S. presidents. Um, I like, uh, even though it's not a biography, Siddhartha, uh, but it's about, what, about one man's journey and the intimate details of his internal strife of figuring out where he belongs in the world and his, and his different belief systems. And he goes through these different cycles in his world. Um, I say those. Yeah. How, uh, how about Ben Franklin? Yeah, of course. I've read all the biographies about Franklin. I, I love the guy. I mean, he's, he's such a, a fun story. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, I was a big fan of the Abraham Lincoln one too, or the, the Dillers. Likewise. Dillers. Yep. Um, I agree. Yep. Yeah. Also, you know, I've read, uh, Henry Kissinger was pretty interesting. The Walter Isaacson of his. So I have not read that one yet. It's been on my list for a while. Yeah. Walter Isaacson. Uh, what are some other ones he wrote? The Steve Jobs, obviously. Um, but yeah, he's good. Yeah, I also liked um, uh, Alexander Hamilton. Yes. I think he is remarkably underappreciated for the contributions he made in the world. And it's, it's a story that with him and his rivalry with Thomas Jefferson and also with John Adams, president, and Benjamin Franklin, uh, it's a great story of how history sometimes, I think, gets it wrong, that we laud Jefferson with all kinds of accolades, but I think Hamilton really made the important contributions. And it's, of course, this is like a historian's battle, but um, I really appreciate digging into details and I appreciate what he made, his, the contributions he made. Although he lost like the marketing war of history in terms of who they honor, I think that hopefully there'll be a revival for him. What would need to be true for you to be interested in, in public service? Or is that something that would ever? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's funny when you say public service, I, like, I immediately like, throw away the term because I think like that categorization of like, if you work for a specific entity, it's somehow categorized as public service, right. but then like if you work in a private entity, you're doing this, private, this selfish thing. I, mean, I guess in my mind, I don't think about it in terms of those capacities. I just sim simply think, what is my unique value add and how could I do something that would improve the world? Oftentimes like you, I, I basically look at leapfrogging the government or going around the yeah. government, not working with the government because I feel like you, the speed at which you can move is much faster. And so... Um, I, I sincerely think the stuff we're investing in is a public service yeah. that, that trying to build good technology will actually better the world in ways that the state just can't. I, I totally agree. I, I was just curious because you mentioned a bunch of presidents and I was curious, you know, if you ever thought, hey, is, is, is it less that, uh, is it more just that that's not your unique value add or not where you... Well, so I mean, I guess I've, I've soft circled a few things in, in life that I want to tackle over the next couple of decades and governance is one. So I have spent an enormous amount of time studying governance. And my basic the theory was that if you look at the history of the United States, we've had a major change in government governance every 60 to 70 years, mm -hmm. like 1800 with Thomas Jefferson taking the presidency, the civil war and the great depression. And then of course we have other exogenous shocks like 9-11 or the financial crisis. So basically big change happens in small windows. Wow. And so, and every time this happens, there's always a theoretical revolution before a practical revolution. And so we have to think through how we're going to cooperate, how we're going to, what kind of systems we're going to have in place. And my idea was we're coming up on this huge change within the world and specifically the United States. And that uh, if a time came where we could actually recontemplate what we we're thinking about doing, we would have needed to have thought through these things. And so the uh, rewriting of the operating system of governance is on my list. I would love to try to tackle that one day, figuring out how we actually create cooperation systems 
that are conducive to our time and place and our technological powers. What are some other things you've soft circled? Um, I think intelligence is an important one. I think our collective ability to solve problems is important. We're building, we're building machines that help us solve problems and machines that work independently of us. I think that our ability to solve big problems will be very important and it comes down to intelligence. Um, ideologies is a big one for me. Uh, what we, how we understand ourselves and the things we aspire to. But to me, if, if you look at the stack of society and if you consider like what builds upon what, to me, those things are the, are the base layer of our understanding of what we, what we want to do and why. And if you, if you can successfully work on those levels, everything else above it will change. Is, is intellect and ideology, is that you know, tackled by things like education and religion? Are there other things? Yeah, they're, they're, all, they're all intertwined, yeah. uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, there's one question here about, which is pretty interesting about kind of, uh, you know, this concept of you know, everyone can make a difference, you know, right away and create something meaningful for society. But this person asks, uh, is that really true when more than half of the world's wealth is controlled? When, you know, as uh, the wealth is so concentrated. Yeah. So it's like, is this the question of like, does, does everyone really have a shot? I mean, the answer is no, right? I mean, it's like incredibly hard to raise yourself from the slums. And so anyone who does that is going to be rare in their ability. Right. Uh, but I, I would say that, um, not to take it too far on the other side, that uh, people will discount their ability to do something. Like I came from nothing. I came from a middle-class family. I didn't have a wealthy uncle or a friend or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm self-made. And so I do think that, and I don't have any special skills, right? I just worked really hard and I was determined on what I was doing. And so I do think that people discount what they can do themselves. And so I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily support that opinion and in the negative, I would, I would more try to find the, the inverse of how people can make a difference. And, and also, I mean, I think it's a fair assessment that people in the world just don't have a fair shot across the board. Are you sympathetic? Uh, how do you give people more fair shot? Is it, is it education? Is it, you know, redistribution of, you know, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I haven't given this this a lot of thought. Um, I just would I just speaking out loud. I suppose I'd say that um, the core skill sets of teaching somebody how to uh, problem solve and how to be resourceful, and then to work around the systems. But to me, that those are two elements that I thought were relevant for myself. Is I was smart enough to to solve a problem. I was resourceful enough to find my way around, and I had the tenacity to continue going when things just continually fell apart. Yeah. What uh, if you were could go back in time to your 25 year old self, but note that your 25 year old self lives in, in 2015 in this world? Mm -hmm. So the the kinds of problems I want to focus on require a certain frame of understanding, and that is specifically, I think of the world like a like a technology stack, which is like a a technical challenge. But basically, just like a computer has an operating system that determines how it works at its core and then applications run on top. If you change the operating system, everything on top of it changes with it. And so with what I aspire to do in life, I need to focus on the things at the core layer, like, uh, like ideologies and cooperation systems within governments because everything else sits on top of it. So I mean, for example, like a couple hundred years ago when the life expectancy was like mid forties, um, if a surgeon would have said, you know what, the most talented surgeon in America, if they would have said, like, what could you focus on to uniquely add value? And that surgeon would have said, you know what, I have come up with a new surgical tool that's going to reduce the incision size from six inches to two inches. And that's going to somehow make a huge difference in human health. Well, really, it wouldn't have mattered because the problem was we had bacteria, had these small things that cause infection and death. But once someone, once we figured out germ theory, that we had this, these, this bacteria that caused the problems, and we figured out um, vaccines and, and sterilization and antibiotics, we radically extended healthy human life to mid seventies. And so to me, solving the bacteria problem or germ theory was like an OS level solution or an operating level system solution. And so what I would say to my 25 year old self is how you understand systems of the world and, and the problems you choose need to be consistent with the kind of scope of, of, uh, of, uh, I guess, effect you want to have. Let's, let's close with talking about legacy. Mm -hmm. What do you want, uh, you know, how to, like, let's say, what do you want your Wikipedia page to say? Uh, and, you know, whatever equivalent exists in the future. What do you want to be known for? Uh, 
Yeah. So one is I want my children to write me a love letter ah, yeah. that I was an exceptional father, that I cared deeply about their lives, that I went all in on trying to teach them to become good human beings. Um, two is that I dared to pursue audacious things. And if I fell in the process, um, that's okay. But that I, I, when I looked at the circumstances I had in life and what I could pot potentially pursue, that I chose the hardest things that I could imagine that would have the most positive impact on humanity. And three, um, I suppose that I care deeply about the outcome of planet Earth, that I sincerely care about what the kind of world we build and what people can do with their time and effort and what we can become. And um, if anything, if I fail at everything I do, that I was um, brave enough to, I guess, talk out loud about these things, even at the risk of failing and becoming insignificant. How have you identified uh, being a father and, you know, uh, and you know, raising your children as as the most important thing for you? Like how, how have you kind of weighed out your first like more macro stuff? Not, and of course you can do both, but you pick that one yeah. first, for example. Yeah, I guess it's a good question. Um, they're my children. I have a responsibility to them. I enjoy yeah. it. I love it. Um, it gives me great insight. Uh, they, um, they keep me on my toes. I just, um, I love doing it. It's a passion. It's not like I felt this obligation that I have to become a good father. I just really want to be. And it makes me a better human in the process. I, I think it helps me become more empathetic yeah. to, right? I mean, like what they experience in life and their friends. Like when I'm at their school and I'm teaching them, I'm hearing what their thoughts are and how they feel about certain topics and what they're aspiring to. It's really insightful. And so um, I'm not sure. I guess I'm just wired that way that I've always wanted that to be that. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, I would, but the second part of the question was, what do you want people to say at your funeral? Uh, but you kind of answered it a little bit with your kids, uh, you know. Uh, is there, yeah. is there more you would say in that context of what you want to be known for? Yeah, I mean, I think, so the past 15 years have been, I mean, unbelievably hard in ways that I hope they can write about in the future. I haven't really been very public about it, but personal trials that would honestly just leave me on the bed at night, just like wishing I could just disappear. And uh, it was a combination of, you know, 24, building, being the, the trenches of entrepreneurship 24 seven, having failures and successes, but the challenge of being an entrepreneur, of having a young family and being a devoted father, of, of uh, relationship challenges, of losing my faith, like my entire world, like everything fell apart in a matter of like 12 to 18 months. And I had to reconstruct my existence from scratch. And um, I guess I would like to be known as having gone through these challenges and having emerged in a way that um, inspires others that they too can come out of the abyss and they can uh, do hard things when it feels like they can't. And if that's a con the only contribution I can make to the world that is useful, that I, hopefully I can be a, a mental model to someone else and say, you know what, like there was this guy, Brian, who he felt the same way I did and somehow he emerged and like made sense of the world and maybe I can too. Yeah. That's a, an amazing way to, uh, to close. Uh, Brian, thank you for, for joining this interview. I can't wait for, uh, you know, when you uh in the next year as you come out with it with the next big thing for us to help promote it too um and to just hear more about it thank you for for coming on thank you i appreciate it i've enjoyed the conversation and lastly you know where can uh all the listeners uh learn more about you and uh you know find you on, on the internet and anything you want to plug of, of you know things you have upcoming uh so i i'm on twitter and i am active so i'd love to continue the conversation with those who are doing things that uh, we can work on together. Yeah, and uh, where can people uh, find your, your books? So it's not published yeah. yet. Um, yeah, but next spring it will be, and, and the children's movement will be, the children's uh, effort will be public. And then of course, a year from now, the company will be public. So I guess all these things I've had in the pipeline for the past two years are gearing up for launch within the next 12 Perfect. months. Perfect. And uh, any challenge uh, for, for the audience? Anything you want to leave? Yeah, I would ask them to ask themselves the Shackleton sniff test. If you're looking out on the world and you're trying to decide what is the most audacious thing you could do that would add value in the world, what would it be? Wow, perfect. Brian has been incredibly inspiring to me and many others. Thank you for taking the time and have a great day. Thanks, Eric. See you. <laughs> okay. This has been Products Hunt Live. That was one of my favorite lives ever. That was amazing. Uh, what an inspiring dude. I didn't even, 
you know, you don't hear about him as much as you do some of these other bigger names, but he's doing, uh, he's doing just cool things. Um, thank you guys all for joining for your fantastic questions and uh, recommend, uh, let us know, uh, you know, at Product Hunt, at Product Hunt Live, who else you want to hear from, uh, you know, what questions you want us to ask. And uh, again, man, this I'm going to listen to this recording. It's like really thoroughly inspiring. <laughs> uh, have a great day, everybody. And I will see you on the next episode of Product Hunt Live. Take it easy.